guys, that was uh, heartwarming. <laughs> all right, so um, as you guys all know, I was there that day. I'm a junior at Stoneman Douglas. Um, not everyone at Stoneman Douglas thinks the same. And uh, oh yeah. So the Second Amendment is a fundamental protector of every other amendment. It's the intrinsic right to bear arms that has for centuries solidified the ability of every single individual to not only defend themselves, but to make sure that the government cannot become tyrannical. After all, our founders understood the importance of ensuring that when a government became oppressive, that there were avenues to make sure that the people could revolt, and therefore gifting them all the means necessary that if such action was necessary, they would be able to do so. Such an idea, like any other, was rightfully embedded into American culture. However, those on the left, who live in their gated communities, who, whilst protected by their armed security every day, don't live through the same lives that we do. A lot of times they live, they live in their own bubble of hypocrisy and ignorance, and we've seen that from my school. But after all, the Second Amendment at its core represents the rightful distrust of our government. Even at my school, we've seen that the government cannot do its damn job. <laughs> So many attempts try to label my rational skepticism as insane as being a conspiracy theorist. But we all know the government would absolutely never, ever overreach overall. They would never do that. We've never seen that before, no. So from personal experience, I can note that the left's utter ignorance, starting from the tragic event of my school, in which a lot of individuals, I'm not gonna name them, but you guys can probably figure it out, you know. Um, started with a mindless, ineffective, and counterintuitive, to be honestly, utterly idiotic um, gun control narrative that painted every single gun owner, no matter who they were, as well as the NRA, as enemies of the people. Even more so, the mainstream fake news media piggybacked off the tragic deaths of my classmates to assist in a huge, unbelievably massive operation of anti-gun control narratives. To be specific, a lot of kids from my school simply live in a bubble. They live in gated communities. Parkland is one of the lowest crime rate cities in the United States, other than after, before the 14th. And as Parkland residents, they can live behind their gated communities in extremely low crime areas, and they seemingly can't understand how the rest of America lives. But we truly understand that not every city is as safe as Parkland. It must be noted that these teenagers are political activists and they are attempting to push legislation and therefore they cannot and they must not be immune to criticism and opposition. They cannot be untouchable. If you're pushing legislation simply as I've been, you should be getting opposition because you are actually changing America. Now what I love about the left's method of packing deceitfulness is no longer effective on Americans as it once was. The Americans understand that all the lies the fake news media is giving them, they don't take it anymore. The endless narrative of why would anyone with a military grade, fully semi-automatic, rapid fire weapon of war would need something like that. And the people understand that it's utter BS. And what liberals don't understand is that it's so simple. As gun ownership increases, gun deaths decrease. And rightfully so, Americans don't trust the government. As a prime example in my school, so many failures of the government happen. It's insane. The cowards of Broward, the FBI, Child Protective Services, school administrators, and Obama's disastrous promise program, just to name a few, all failed. The government completely failed my community, and as a pinnacle of their utter stupidity, people want to give away their natural rights once more to a failing government who couldn't do its job in the first place. So you know what we need to do? We have to make sure that the government is held accountable for its wrongdoings and its ineffectiveness. The government completely failed my community. They are untrustworthy, defective, and corrupt. That is now frantically trying, as with Kenneth, to cover up them falsifying information for their incompetent behinds. <laughs> I have to be PC here, sorry guys. 
So why allocate more power to the people in government who couldn't do their job in the first place? I don't understand this utter idioticness. It's, it's a blatant inconsistency. Had the government enforced its own laws, had it done its own jobs, February 14th would not have happened. This isn't hard. We need to hold our government officials accountable. We cannot get accustomed to something like this happening and us grieving and sending our prayers and then nothing happens. We have to make sure we take action to make sure this actually never happens again versus what makes us feel good by tweeting and sending letters and blah, blah, blah. But we need to do something that will actually make sure our schools are safe. We have to make sure that we grow the Second Amendment. This might seem somewhat counterintuitive, but if you look at the statistics, the Second Amendment saves so much more lives than it takes. Around every year, 13,000 people are killed in homicides. 27,000 are in suicides. But hundreds of thousands are saved every year by proper gun ownership. We need to understand <laughs> that there is a massive benefit to having the Second Amendment in our society. Because I do trust American civilians to operate firearms, as our founding fathers did. We have a sense of morality and that it leads us to be responsible gun owners. And we have to understand that. that. We have to trust our own citizens because if a government should be able to trust its own citizens. But in addition, we have to continue to be pushing legislation. And even more so, we can't get accustomed to winning. We can't. We have to continue winning. We cannot get tired of winning. When Trump said that we would get tired of winning, you guys thought he was joking. But look at us all right now. Midterm elections are right around the corner. We need to get energized. We have to keep fighting. Right now, our current state, even though we're set to lose less seats in the House, we cannot take that defeat. You can never win by playing defense. We have the House currently, we have the Senate, we have SCOTUS, we have the executive. We're not doing anything. We're not pushing any pro 2A legislation. We're sitting here, we're standing here, and we're not doing absolutely anything. What are we doing? No, truly, we have this amazing opportunity of a majority, and we're not doing anything. Why aren't we pushing pro 2A legislation? Time and time again, guns have saved exponentially more lives than they have taken every year. We have to expand the Second Amendment. We have to grow it. In addition, we cannot offer concessions to the left. As it was said on March for Our Lives on their beautiful media stunt, when they give us that inch, that bump stock ban, we will take a mile. We're not here for crumbs. Ladies and gentlemen, they're not here to simply take away your bump stocks. At the end of the day, what they truly want to see, they want to ban semi-automatic weapons. It's on their website. They are pushing to take away all semi-automatic weapons. The basic foundation of the Second Amendment is being encroached upon. No, it's a serious threat. Ladies and gentlemen, as much as we la love to laugh and point at the idiocracies of the left, that's all we're doing. Those pose a real threat, whether you enjoy hearing about it or not. Facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> we have to fight, we have to push legislation, and even more so, we have to push the Second Amendment. To be honest, it might be our last chance to do so. And even more so, we must never, ever get tired of winning. <laughs> all right. Thank you. We have some questions. Uh, Kyle, first of all, I think you'd make a great congressperson down the road. That's not You're my wonderful. intention. Secondly, uh, I hope you don't go to college. <laughs> and third, uh, Charlie Kirk mentioned that you were organizing high schools across yes, America. And I would love to know how you're going about doing that. It's a very complex, it's a very complex project. And are you going to be under Turning Point? Uh, yeah, I just, got, I just got on Turning Point as the director of high school outreach. <laughs> and what my role is going to be growing the amount of uh, high school campuses that have chapters. 
And I really want to see a huge increase this year in the amount of turning point chapters because what they do is that they allow the fundamental basis for conservative ideas to be brought up in discussions and then eventually it educates the schools and the students in them for when eventually they do get on college campuses, they can be productive members of the conservative discussion. Uh, Over here. Back here. Sweet. Uh, well done, Kyle. I started following you on Twitter a few weeks ago, so excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, earlier it was mentioned that, um, you know, follow the money, who's funding all this anti-gun research. I've heard that uh, a lot of your peers on, on the left that were there that day, mm -hmm. how are they funding and organizing all of this? I mean, my God, travel to D.C. and here and, and peer, media appearances. I've read and heard there's money behind that from, from our uh, mm -hmm. opponents on the left. Yeah. Why don't you speak to that, please? I mean, it's true, there is money behind it, but I, have to I think we have to make sure that we don't just consider these kids as pawns. I mean, we have to make sure that the, uh, these are players pushing legislation. We have to take them seriously. We shouldn't take these kids as a joke because at the end of the day, they are motivating people to vote and they are motivating some decisions of congressmen. And we have to make sure that people are informed. So we can't just mock and constantly just joke around. They are making strides and therefore I think we have to energize the right even more. Kyle, thank you for coming today. Uh, you mentioned that we need to grow the Second Amendment mm -hmm. and that we need to get the Republican Party to start taking it more seriously. Any specific legislative recommendations, either at municipal, state, or the federal level? Yeah, I mean, nationally right now, we have the position to do a big change for the Second Amendment. And I think it starts with um, the ability for anyone in America to carry, to concealed carry a firearm. Because it's, it's been proven that concealed carry saves so many, more, so many lives across the board that it should be allowed, not just by state by state, since it has such a massive positive impact on our society. Since the Second Amendment says, shall not infringe, mm -hmm. shouldn't we yes, be sir. deleting legislation rather than adding it in other areas? Well, I think the best thing is having limited government. The less government we have, the better. <laughs> but... It also comes into mind that we have to make sure that we ensure that the Second Amendment can't be infringed upon in the future when the situation might not be, might actually be different than we currently have. Can I go? Okay. <laughs> no, I, I just, uh, I'm sort of a, you know, I ask the same question, you know, just to get opinions. The, uh, I'll ask you the same question, and, and I really want to have your contact information after this is over, but. Sure. Uh, um, since I do a program in the high schools here, you know, I'm wondering if you would come to LA, mm -hmm. or if there's some point you could come here, and uh, would it be a good idea to do some type of training for the for the high school or for you know kids in the, say high school uh, to go and learn uh, gun safety uh, and self defense? What would what's your idea? On that? Great. All right, um, I think irrelevant if if it's for high school or not, I think that throughout America we have to make sure that we have the, the young generation who are adept to being viable gun owners and who are actually educated on this matter. Um, I think the reference you made before that we specifically made it by the state, which, which brought the kids to gun ranges, I don't think that's the responsibility of the state. I'm a big believer in making the state stay out of like, my personal decisions. But I really think that parents should have a much greater responsibility in educating their sons and their daughters on proper gun safety and education. All right, Kyle, uh, I, uh, right here, Sweet in the middle. See All right. I uh, teach classes on the US Constitution. I've written books on the Constitution. And I just wanted to make a comment that I appreciate the fact that when you first mentioned in the Second Amendment, you got it right. The oh, yeah. reason for it is to defend against a tyrannical government. Yes, so I just wanted to say I appreciate you understanding. You no, know, I think what's the great purpose. is that we've seen a shift in debate in, in the entire notion that it's no longer just self-defense. It's also people understand that it's to make sure that a government can't become right. tyrannical. And I think that's been great. Thank you so much for your courage and great speech. We are all looking forward for you and children like you leading our country. <laughs> Quick question for you. As a um, youngster who is in uh, school, and I don't know the makeup of the schools that you're in, uh -huh. what, do you, uh, what is your personal opinion 
of um, the increase of children from other cultures that has completely um, taken over um, our schools are no longer you know, American born or raised, but there are children who are being raised in other cultures who are more aggressive cultures. Do you see any um, influence of these children inundating our schools in the behavior, in the general behavior of our American Are you asking me students? if I believe that other cultures might have a more aggressive tendency than our current culture? And is that influencing the children in school? Oh, okay. Uh, I don't necessarily know enough to make that distinction. Um, what I could tell you is that I believe strongly in assimilation. Um, but other than that, I can't. I don't know. I don't want to give you an answer on the specific statistics of the aggressiveness of other cultures specifically. But I think that incoming immigrants, just my personal opinion, should be strongly encouraged to assimilate. That's okay. Hi. Thank God for you, first of all. <laughs> and secondly, um, how do you fight the emotion that the left is so good at with what we tend to do is facts and the Constitution and uh, what, are, how, what are you finding that is effective when you're talking to young people and, and switching hearts and minds? Got you. Um, well, I think the majority of young people do understand the importance of facts over feelings and they, they understand the importance of facts rather than just going for emotions and I think that properly educating the youth to allow them to make their own conclusion, most of the time they lean towards the right if you present them with all of the facts. What is um, the temperature like for you at school right now with all the other kids? Oh, I get a lot of stare downs. Like, I'll call him every day and I'll be like, look how many stare downs I got today. Like the <laughs> friends you had before, are they still your friends or are they kind of not? your friends anymore. Oh, specifically? I mean, I had a bunch of, I'd give it like a 95% of people who I used to associate don't associate with me anymore. 95% <laughs> drop in friend, friends. I truly don't care. No, I, I get that. I have like two friends that were <laughs> Okay, this cool. Awesome. Good job. Thank you. Terrific. How are you dealing with the difference in media presence between the kids on the right, mm -hmm. a certain male in particular, and your, uh, I guess we're not naming names, but we all know who we're talking about. Um, and versus the coverage you're getting, which is primarily Fox and- I'm and not sure you're referring to on the left. I don't, I don't know. <sighs> Mr. Hogg. Oh, okay, that's who you're referring to. I said on the left. I said on, okay. No, I was joking. Okay, got it, got it. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm, because the coverage is so lopsided yeah. and outside of um, probably Stormy Daniels, they're probably the most frequent visitors on, on the news on uh -huh. the left, despite everything that's going on, and you're sort of shut out. So oh, how do you see I mean, that? that's understandable since most of mainstream media is left, but I don't view an issue as, as Hogg and Co. going on mainstream media, but I really want to see some opposition. I don't want them to have the ability to be untouchable and say whatever they want and then not face any rebuttals or any different point of views. So I, I'm all for having an open discussion on CNN, MSNBC, ABC. It won't happen, but <laughs> I, wanna see, I wanna see them not have the ability to simply say whatever and then not get the consequences because they're simply teenagers. And I don't think that's a fair statement since they're actually pushing political agenda. For instance, when I go on networks that don't agree with me, like when I went on Piers Morgan, um, yeah, I'm basically going to the lion's den, and I go in there knowingly that I'm going to get criticism, and that's fine. I should be getting criticism. Okay, and one other thing, how do you, how, what, what do you think is the reason why many of the other uh, Stoneman Douglas kids have sort of backed away, and um, David Hogg is still front and center? What do you mean is, why is well, the Because like, like, like Emma Gonzalez and, and some of the other kids are much oh, less it's prevalent it's than they had been. It's simple that the mainstream media doesn't care as much as they did when it was actually profitable to them. And we've seen that. And then currently now, what I've seen in Santa Fe is I'm waiting for CNN to do, the to, to do a town hall in Santa Fe since they're, so, um, they're such advocates for allowing the young people to have a voice, which they're actually quite not. They only do whatever suits their, their agenda, and we've seen that. Um, what I've seen is, is some, it's, it's quite disgusting that even 10, af 10 minutes after the shooting was happening, people are already using that as a platform 
as a political agenda to push their narrative. And when I went out of school, there were, the entire road were filled with news cars trying to interview kids. And I, I don't think that it's quite right that people are trying to utilize these kids to push an agenda. And when it doesn't fit their agenda, they simply, they simply shun on them or they, they um, just don't use them anymore. Hi, Kyle. How are you? I've been so impressed with you. Um, I got a question, and that is, there was a story in the New York Times this morning that said voter registration among young people has risen very sharply in mm -hmm. the wake of the Parkland shooting. Mm -hmm. It said it was skewed towards Democrat, but I wanted to ask you, what sort of sense are you getting from the activism you're doing? There was also a poll about a week ago that said millennials are not are, are fading away from the left. They're, they're suddenly not going that. You're younger than a millennial, but... What sense are you getting from your activism? Are you getting a response? And could those voters that were, re that huge number of voters registered, could some of it be people who are, you, you gotcha. know, they recognize the dangers of gun control mm -hmm. and, and are, are absolutely the opposite. They're in I your view. I think a reason that we've seen a shift from a lot of people considering themselves as being on the left or Democrats is because the sheer absurdity and insanity of mainstream media, which is pushing people towards the right, for how every single time something happens, they completely just lash out. And even more so, I think that millennials are starting to understand all aspects of this debate, and therefore, by doing so, they get all the facts, and eventually, they move over to the conservative side. Um, to talk about the point that you mentioned that um, young voter registration went in the, in the uh, Democrat um, section, I mean, the young voters for Democrats are completely energized. What I think we have to do is we have to energize the right quite equally and to be more exact, more than the left. Um, because the Democrats have always had the, um, the power position for the young generation simply because a lot of them aren't as informed as the older generation. I think there's a saying that you're a Democrat once until you reach the age of 30 and after that you become a Republican. And I think some of that lies in fact that the older generation is a little <coughs> bit more um, educated than the young generation. Hi, Kyle. How are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> um, I actually just had a comment for you, because um, I think you raised a very important point about how you guys basically walked out of the school and started shoving, ha had the media shoving microphones mm -hmm. in your face. Yeah. Um, I spent about four months interviewing mass shooting survivors from a variety of communities just to understand the process of recovery, and I've heard stories about um, them posing as trauma counselors, jumping out of bathrooms and everything, so you know, I think that speaks to your character and your ability to handle that when you should be allowed to grieve and figure out what just happened to you without becoming a political pawn for the media. So I'm sorry that they did that for you. But more importantly, I just actually wanted to comment to you because first of all, um, both you and Kenneth are amazing speakers, but I think that our generation has failed you horribly. Um, we've known about the problems of school safety since 1999 and before that, and nothing was done. And I think that the fact that you guys have had to be fo uh, focused into advocacy and thrust into the spotlight speaks to the fact that people before you just failed you. And so I'm sorry that you aren't getting to enjoy the high school experience to go and just be a high school kid that you're having to fight to keep yourselves alive. And I just, your voice is so important and powerful. So thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. It's so wonderful to hear a young person speak so articulately. I want to know what motivated you to come to this point where you're an outlier in your generation, and at what point did you really feel these feelings about it? So it started off simply, so it started off as this. When a bunch of kids from Stone Douglas went to Tallahassee, I was one of them, and I saw an insane push for the anti-Second Amendment position. And at the beginning, I didn't really have an opinion. I, I had a right-leaning opinion, but I really wasn't formulated as I am today. So when this happened, I was still defending the Second Amendment. So after this, I went home, and I was in shock at the amount of anti-Second Amendment legislation and talk that was being proposed, specifically from kids from my school. So I researched it even more and more, and I realized that all what my peers were doing was completely wrong and um, counterintuitive to the actual change that they tried to bring. So I realized that there was an issue, and that no one from Stoma Douglas was representing a Republican or conservative point of view. So um, I, by myself, I had to get myself an interview on Fox News. No, one's, no one was pushing me. I realized that I had to do this. So I did an interview on Fox News, and I presented my opinions, um, and then it blew up. In essence, I, I never truly wanted where I am today. That was never an end goal as where I am today. 
Um, I really just wanted to show that not every kid at Stoneman Douglas wants to get rid of the Second Amendment and get rid of semi-automatic weapons. Well, I, I also wanted to thank you, like everybody else, for speaking up as you have. Um, I, and I uh, really agree with the facts instead of feelings. Do you or anyone else in the room uh, know of any, any unassailable facts that prove that gun ownership, you know, uh, saves lives more than it loses them, or is there no such thing as unassailable facts? No, no, I, I get what you're saying. Um, every year, 40,000 people are, are, are there are 40,000 deaths by gun. 66% um, of that are suicides. 33% uh, of those are homicides, but the majority of those homicides are gang violence. Um, and then the semi-automatic aspect of the deaths is, I believe, 3% of all gun deaths are with semi-automatics. But 1% of those are, are homicides, I believe so. Um, in essence, it comes down to this, that, and, and there's another statistics that with those 40,000 deaths, hundreds of thousands are saved every year. So in essence, the, the cost to, to um, detriment ratio of the Second Amendment is heavily in favor of supporting the Second Amendment. The question I would ask people is, can you name one place in the world that's banned guns, either all guns or all handguns, mm -hmm. and see murder rates stay the same or go down? Because I can't find it. Every single place that's tried to ban guns has seen murder rates go up, often by very large amounts, and it raises a serious question about what's the basic notion of benefits from guns. And it also illustrates, I think, that the people who are most likely to obey the law, the most people who are most likely to affect it, are law-abiding citizens. It's not the purpose. What I think it really comes down to this is, is, is this. Criminals don't follow the laws you have in place, so <laughs> it's pretty obvious. No matter what you do, they're going to they're gonna not abide by the law.